Hi guys and welcome to the second lecture for chapter 2. Today we'll be going over systems and cycles. So understanding human impacts on the environment requires a understanding of the complex environmental systems that we are surrounded with. And this is because many issues that are considered ecological or environmental issues are multifaceted and interconnected. And that's because many of Earth's systems are multifaceted and interconnected. And when we talk about a system, we're specifically referring to a network of relationships among components that interact with and influence one another. And they, by interacting and influencing one another, we mean that they exchange energy, they exchange matter, or they exchange information with one another. So they're constantly exchanging any of these three components and interacting with other components within this entity. That entity is called a system. And a system works specifically by receiving inputs of energy, matter, or information, processing these inputs, and then producing some sort of output. So it takes in these inputs, rearranges them in some kind of way, and puts out an output which is then going to be the input for another system and these are how different systems can be interconnected with one another now there are four major systems within the earth and we're going to go over all of them now the first is the atmosphere and the atmosphere can be thought of as the envelope of gases surrounding the entire earth or any other planet and there are multiple layers of the atmosphere within the context of that system but we're going to dive into that into a later chapter for now just think of the atmosphere as the gaseous system that surrounds the entire planet Next, we should talk about the hydrosphere, and the hydrosphere refers to all of the waters on Earth's surface. These are going to be things such as the ocean, they're going to be lakes or uh, rivers, they could refer to the groundwater, something that we talked about when we were looking at the ecosystem services, and it can be uh, the water vapor in the atmosphere, so already you see a connection. And these can be things like clouds, rainfall, or water vapor. So you can already begin to see that there is a layer of overlap between the atmosphere as well as the hydrosphere. Next, when we think of the lithosphere, that is going to be the rigid outer part of the Earth consisting of the crust and the upper mantle. Note that the lithosphere doesn't mean the entirety of the solid component of the Earth. Most biological organisms uh, or anything that really goes on doesn't really interact with anything deeper than about a mile of the crust. And so when we specifically look at the lithosphere, we're looking at only the crust, that outer layer that actually interacts with biological organisms or any of the other systems on the planet. Finally, we're going to have the biosphere. And the biosphere is broadly referred to as all of the planet's organisms and the abiotic components, meaning the other three systems with which they interact. So it is not just everything that is alive on the planet, it is also an interaction with the lithosphere, the atmosphere, and the hydrosphere. So think of the biosphere as all the other spheres that we just talked about, plus living organisms. The next thing we need to talk about when we refer to systems are something called feedback loops. And feedback loops are circular processes in which a system's output serves as an input for that same system or another system. And there are two major types of feedback loops. There's a positive feedback loop and a negative feedback loop. And I really need you to pay attention here because a lot of students get tripped up on what serves as a positive and what serves as a negative feedback loop because most people People think negative is bad and positive is good, but in this case it's actually most often the opposite. When we look at a negative feedback loop, think of a stabilizing process. Basically a negative feedback loop is a process which tends to dampen or buffer changes to that system. So this holds a system to some sort of equilibrium state to make it more stable. Basically what happens here is that there will be something that will try to shift or knock a system off balance. And a negative feedback loop brings that system back to its original state. So negative feedback loop think of as a stabilizing loop. Something knocks the system off and the feedback loop restabilizes it. In this case, think of, for example, uh, sweating, which is a great example of a negative feedback loop. Say that you uh, t walk outside on a hot summer day. You were in a nice air-conditioned room, you were nice and cool, and instantly you were now exposed to the sun's light and the sun's heat. Because more often than not, it's going to be hotter outside on a summer day than it is inside. 
instantly when you begin to heat up, your body is shifted off balance. You're, you're the system in this case, and you have gone from being nice and cool to beginning to heat up. A stabilizing force or a negative feedback loop built into your system is, a, uh, is sweating. Sweating is the release of water from your pores, and when the water evaporates, it takes some of that heat with it. And that sweating essentially cools your body back down to what the system was. So you were cool, you stepped outside, began to warm up, you sweat, and you are now back to the temperature that you were before. That is, in a nutshell, a negative feedback loop. When you're cold out, actually, the opposite happens. Say that you're inside on a nice winter day where it's actually pretty cold outside, so you're in a nice warm room. When you step outside, you instantly are now in a colder environment and you begin to decrease in body temperature. Your Another negative feedback loop is actually built in there as well. When you step into a colder environment, your system, your body is knocked off balance. You were at a nice temperature and now you are now losing heat. A negative feedback loop there is a process called shivering. When we shiver, we convert uh, kinetic energy into thermal or heat energy and we begin to heat our body back up. So again, your body is a system. You're at a nice stable temperature. You walk outside in a, on a winter day you lose heat and when you shiver you convert uh, the kinetic energy to thermal energy heat energy and you begin to heat back up bringing your body back to normal this again is another built-in negative feedback loop and in addition this plays on a different theme in that there are often a lot of negative feedback loops built into biological organisms and biological systems and this is called homeostasis Homeostasis is essentially the tendency of a system, normally a biological system, to maintain relatively constant internal conditions. And homeostasis is something that you'll see again and again in different biological organisms and ecosystems because there are negative feedback loops built in that kind of bring the system back to balance when it's been knocked off whack. Now contrast this with something called a positive feedback loop. And when you think of a positive feedback loop, I want you to think of an amplifying process or, if you'd like, think of a vicious cycle. Basically, a positive feedback loop is a process which tends to enhance or amplify changes to the system. Basically, this moves a system farther and farther away from equilibrium. equilibrium. So, in a negative feedback loop, the system gets knocked off balance and the negative feedback loop brings it back to equilibrium. In a positive feedback loop, once the system is knocked off balance, the system continues to move farther and farther away. Basically, it spirals out of control. A perfect example of a positive feedback loop is in climate change. So, think of ice as a reflective substance. Because ice is white, it reflects light and it reflects solar radiation back into space. As we heat up the planet, something that's happening right now is that a lot of ice in the Antarctic and the Arctic is beginning to melt. When ice is turned into water, when it heats up and melts into water, we lose that Arctic sea ice. That sea ice no longer, because water no longer reflects radiation and heat, the planet heats up even faster because it's lost that white ice. When the planet heats up faster, more ice begins to melt. When more ice begins to melt, there is no less radiation being reflected, and you can see how this begins to cause the system to spiral out of control. So, where a pot, where a negative feedback loop brings the system back to normal, a positive feedback loop or a vicious cycle spirals the system completely out of control or amplifies the system farther and farther away from its equilibrium state. Now that we have an idea of what a system is and uh, how different types of feedback loops can change or alter or, in contrast, stabilize a system, we can now really begin to dive into something called ecosystems. Ecosystems are biological systems consisting of both living organisms and the abiotic or non-living organisms with which they interact. So, a couple of quick terms here. Biotic means living, abiotic means non-living. When you think of living, think of the puppy, back in the introduction uh, lecture to this entire course. When you think of non-living or abiotic, think of the pet rock. Now, this uh, ecosystems are composed of a ton of different components. Things such as plants, 
animals, water, and nutrients. When you think of an ecosystem, think of the biosphere, but on a smaller scale. This is also going to be living organisms interacting with smaller components of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and lithosphere, but just on a much smaller localized scale. And this, when we look at ecosystems, we're focusing instead of on global issues, we're focusing on more local, immediate interactions between organisms and their non-living environments. Now we touched on this briefly in the previous lecture uh, for this chapter, but matter and energy flow through ecosystems. Energy flows as a one-way system from the sun outwards. So basically, energy can enter the earth through the sun as, as a direct result from the sun, and then it can also leave the planet as a one-way flow of energy. However, matter is conserved in a closed or recycling system. So matter is recycled over and over again. It can't actually leave the planet. However, energy comes through the, uh, comes through the sun, stays at the planet for a little while, and then leaves in different uh, forms, usually going to be in the form of heat, light, or sound. So energy, one-way system, uh, matter closed recycling system. And we touched on this a little bit in the energy slides in the end of the last lecture for chapter two. Basically, the sun it powers uh, most of the energy in biological uh, ecosystems, and it enters in through solar energy. That solar energy is converted by plants and other autotrophs into usable sugars. Basically, they take the sun's energy and they store that energy in the chemical bonds of carbohydrates. Those carbohydrates are then eaten by different organisms that eat plants, and it forms the entire basis of the food chain. And this is basically how solar energy flows into the earth and then through these different biological systems. However, matter is recycled over and over again. Basically, uh, grasses and other autotrophs take raw nutrients and they integrate them into their tissues. Those tissues are eaten and then integrated into other organisms as you move up the food chain. And then after those higher up organisms die, the other organisms break those, those tissues down and return them back to the soil as raw nutrients. Those raw nutrients are then retaken up by plants and the cycle continues again. So again, solar energy and energy in particular flows through ecosystems, matter is recycled over and over again within ecosystems. And when we think of ecosystems converting solar energy into usable forms of energy for other organisms, we use a measure known as ecosystem productivity. So productivity is the rate at which autotrophs, plants, anything that photosynthesizes, converts energy to biomass. And it is typically used as a measure of biological efficiency. Now, there are a few subterms here that are really important as well. Net primary productivity, or NPP, is the, the energy and biomass that remains in a system after autotrophs have used enough energy of their own for their immediate internal processes. So the total productivity is all of the energy that autotrophs per unit time convert uh, into biomass. However, Autotrophs, like any other organism, use some of that energy for their own needs. So it, like a, a plant uses energy just like any other biological organism, and it burns some as it's growing, as it's drawing water from the ground, just anything that it needs for its own uh, metabolic purposes. When we subtract the amount of energy needed for plants' total metabolic purposes uh, from the total amount of energy that it produces, you get the net primary productivity. And the reason you get any extra energy left over is that most of the energy that a plant converts from solar energy is stored in the plant later on. Think of the stored energy as sort of like the plant's fat. It needs energy for later just in case it doesn't get the opportunity to photosynthesize, so it stores a lot of that energy inside its own tissue. So again, total productivity minus metabolism of the plant gives you your net primary productivity. And it should be noted that when you look across all of the plants or any autotroph in an ecosystem, ecosystems vary in their total net primary productivity. High uh, net primary productivity ecosystems are ecosystems whose plants rapidly convert energy to biomass and store that biomass very, very efficiently. Examples of ecosystems with high net primary productivity are tropical rainforests, swamps, marshes, or coral reefs.
Examples of ecosystems with lower net primary productivity are examples of ecosystems who convert solar energy to biomass at much slower rates. And these are going to be uh, things like deserts, the Arctic tundra, or the ocean floor. And in these areas, these autotrophs or these plants have adapted to survive and in this case, survival means being able to weather some of those very harsh conditions. So they're not necessarily as concerned with growing really quickly or photosynthesizing very fast. They're just trying to hang on. And so typically those organisms are going to photosynthesize at much slower rates simply because they are investing their energy and their time into different survival tactics so that they can survive in those given much harsher environments. Now, nutrient cycles are, are nutrient or biogeochemical cycles are the movements of nutrients through ecosystems. Remember that while energy flows through ecosystems, matter is recycled over and over again. And matter refers to different types of nutrients. Nutrients are elements or compounds that organisms need for survival. Things like nitrogen compounds, phosphorus compounds, or carbon compounds that are integral for the survival of different plants and and other organisms. Healthy ecosystems use these nutrients and then recycle them over and over again. And healthy ecosystems provide fresh water, clean air, healthy soil, and plenty of food and nutrients for living organisms, such as you, uh, and which are recycled over and over again as the organisms grow, incorporate more nutrients, and then die. However, human activities, uh, as they have degraded different ecosystems, have begun to chip away at this nutrient cycling capability. And because nutrient cycling is such a valuable supporting ecosystem service, it really pays to dive into some of the specifics here and how we are altering these nutrient cycles and how we are beginning to really disrupt these cycles on a global scale. Now the first of these nutrient cycles is the water cycle and have we really and though we really haven't impacted the water cycle too severely yet we might still uh, do so with climate change we'll get a little bit more into that when we talk about the climate change lecture later on in this course now within the water cycle water typically begins for the purposes of this uh, this conceptual diagram. It, water begins in the ocean. Water is then evaporated into uh, the atmosphere where it exists in the form of water vapor. Once that water vapor has cooled down, it condenses back into liquid water which falls to the ground. If the water falls back in the, into the ocean, then the cycle just repeats from there. But if it falls in the terrestrial system, usually the water will flow either down uh, downhill in the form of streams, congregate in the lakes, and then very gradually make its way back into the ocean. It could also go a separate route by going down, percolate through the ground, and wind up in groundwater where it won't reach the ocean again for maybe thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years. Water can stay in the form of groundwater for a very, very long time. And so as this cycle continues, so we have evaporation, condensation, precipitation, runoff, and then the cycle begins again back into the ocean. And this continues over and over again as time goes on and is primarily solar powered due to the fact that solar, uh, solar radiation is what causes the evaporation in the first place. Next, we have the carbon cycle, and I apologize, some of the nutrient cycles that I'm going to offer here aren't the greatest diagrams. I tried to find the best ones I could, but uh, some of them uh, don't look quite as pretty as I would have liked them to. And before we get into the carbon cycle, I should take a note to uh, talk about how within the larger context of any given nutrient cycle, there are a bunch of mini cycles. So in the context of the water cycle, for example, even though water uh, is flowing uh, downstream from the terrestrial system back into the ocean, water is constantly being evaporated in that transit uh, in that system as well. So you constantly have evaporation going on and creating mini cycles at every step of the water cycle. Similarly, for carbon uh, and phosphorus and nitrogen, the other nutrient cycles we'll talk about, there are also little mini cycles that cause, for example, carbon to be released back into the atmosphere, for nitrogen to be released back in the atmosphere or be reintegrated back into the soil. So while there is a large general nutrient cycle, there are a lot of miniature cycles that are constantly happening as well. With, for the carbon cycle, we're going to start with the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which tends to be the largest reservoir of carbon that we 
had accessible to us. Basically producers, those are our autotrophs, our plants, our algae, anything that photosynthesizes, move carbon from the atmosphere, from the air, into their plant tissues through photosynthesis. So they, it begins with the conversion of sunlight and CO2 into sugars, and that is incorporated into plant tissues. Now, a mini cycle occurs where some of that uh, carbon is re-released back into the atmosphere because the plant is metabolically processing that carbon. Like any other organism, like we just talked about, plants uh, have some kind of metabolic need. So they're burning a little bit of that carbon, the carbon's being re-released. However, most of that carbon is stored and it is integrated into those plant tissues. That carbon is then eaten by organisms that like to eat those plants. And so the carbon is shifted from the plants into the organism. So some of, you know, say a, go a billy goat, for example, uh, in the diagram below, that goat has eaten some of the, the leaves from that tree and has incorporated some of those tissues into its own, uh, into its own tissues. Now, that goat also is burning uh, some of that energy. It is also respirating, so it is burning some of the energy that it has gotten from the plant and releasing carbon dioxide. So again, we get another miniature cycle, and you can see that from the arrow uh, termed animal respiration in the diagram below. Now, in addition, there is also another form, another path that carbon can take in the form of a carbon sink. So those plants, those trees, when that tree dies, it falls to the ground and is incorporated into the soil. Similarly, when an animal dies, that animal uh, decays and uh, rots. Now, now, two things can happen here. Either a fungus or a bacteria will come in and break down those tissues into different components so they will release a little bit of CO2, or alternatively, that carbon is sequestered deep into the ground. And that is where we get a lot of that fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are stored carbon from the decaying organisms that occurred millions of years ago. As those organisms continue to respirate and die, they pull carbon out of the atmosphere and sink it into the ground. However, we are beginning to alter this carbon cycle because we are extracting that carbon from the ground and releasing it into the atmosphere. So we are contributing to that carbon reservoir in the atmosphere. We are taking carbon that has been in the ground for millions of years and we are re-releasing it back into the atmosphere. And so we're beginning to alter this cycle in ways that it hasn't been altered in in millions of years. And so in addition to the burning of fossil fuels, we remove carbon uh, in, from the ground and into the atmosphere in a second way, and that is through deforestation. Whenever we clear-cut forests, we are taking carbon that has been incorporated into plant tissues, and we are rapidly burning it or allowing it to decay and be re-released back into the atmosphere through either the direct combustion of that wood or through the decay, basically letting bacteria and fungi break down that biomass very quickly and sending it again into the atmosphere. So two ways that we that humans impact the carbon cycle, burning of fossil fuels and deforestation. Next we have the nitrogen cycle and like the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle is a little complicated so bear with me. The largest reservoir of nitrogen in, on the planet is in the atmosphere in the form of N2, basically two atoms of nitrogen covalently bonded together. Now the air we breathe is actually 79% nitrogen and the reason we we don't really notice this is that nitrogen gas is inert. It doesn't want to do anything with anyone. It's happy, it's stable, and it doesn't want to come out of that nice stable form. However, it can be pulled out of the gas and into something that's usable in two forms. And the process in which it is pulled out of the air is called nitrogen fixation. And this can happen via lightning strikes. So really high energy can split those uh, molecules out of the N2 state and into uh, ammonium ion, NH3 minus, or or legumes, a type of plant, can absorb nitrogen gas and then incorporate it into their tissues in the form of NH3-. NH3-, by the way, can't really be used by anything other than certain types of bacteria. However, through a process known as nitrification, NH3- is converted into NO3- by different types of bacteria. Now, NO3- can actually be used by plants and animals. Plants uptake those NO3- or nitrate ions, and then animals eat plants and incorporate those that nitrate ion into their actual tissues. Once those uh, organisms decay and break down back into the soil, bacteria convert NO3- nitrate 
nitrate back into N2, where it is actually in a, in a process known as denitrification, where it can re-enter the atmosphere. Now the phosphorus cycle is a little simpler and a little different in that the reservoir of phosphorus is not in the atmosphere like carbon and nitrogen. The reservoir of phosphorus is actually in phosphate rock, which is in, actually buried in the sediment. So weathering releases phosphorus from rocks, usually limestone, uh, and into the water and into the soil. So it's broken down and incorporated into water and soil. Plants absorb phosphorus through the soils via their roots and incorporate it into their biome. Mass. Animals eat the plants, and then when plants die, they return the phosphorus back into the soil. So it is kind of different in that the phosphorus never actually reaches the atmosphere. It kind of stays in the rocks and in the soils, or if we're in an aqueous environment, it kind of say, stays in the water column, settles briefly into the soil or briefly into the ocean sediment, and then is reuptaken into different organisms in the uh, ocean or pelagic environments. Now, human impacts to nitrogen and phosphorus come in the form of fertilizer. Since the Industrial Revolution and since around the early 1900s, we have figured out how to mine phosphorus. In fact, in Florida, there are actually quite a few phosphate mines over in the peninsula. In addition, we have figured out through synthetic processes how to fix our own nitrogen. And so we have been able to artificially increase these resources greatly beyond what we would naturally see in a natural setting. And if too much fertilizer is applied to locations within within the same watershed, it can cause enormous problems. A watershed is an area from which all water drains into the same water body. Now that water body could be a lake, it could be a river, or it could be a bay. And in this particular case, because I work on the Chesapeake Bay and because it is a fantastic case study in eutrophication, we're going to look at what happens when too much fertilizer winds up in the same water body in a process known as eutrophication and dead zones. So when we look at uh, the process of eutrophication, eutrophication is simply defined as the artificial increase of nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus, far beyond what a ecosystem is normally used to. So normally there's a limit to uh, how much nitrogen and phosphorus is typically seen in an ecosystem. And when we, uh, when we add too many nutrients to that system beyond what it would normally see, that process is called eutrophication. Now, Sometimes this happens naturally, but far more often it is human-induced or anthropogenic eutrophication. Step one of the eutrophication cycle is that excess amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus are swept into a water body, usually from fertilizer, as a result of runoff. So rainwater will come in, sweep through farms and different lawns, and sweep that fertilizer into a water body. Then what happens is that phytoplankton and other types of algae do what's called a bloom. And you need to understand that phytoplankton and algae are opportunistic in nature. Very, very seldom do they ever get huge amounts of nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus. And they have evolved to very quickly take advantage of whenever that happens. So usually maybe twice a year in spring and summer, there is a influx of nitrogen and phosphorus naturally into a system. And those phytoplankton and those algae bloom right then because that's when they get the most food. So they explode in growth and then they die off as the nitrogen phosphorus go away. However, when we artificially increase nitrogen phosphorus into a system, the algae bloom or they explode in growth, but because that that nitrogen and phosphorus isn't natural, that seasonal variation doesn't go away. The nitrogen and phosphorus keeps coming, and so the algae bloom and bloom and bloom, and they absolutely explode in growth beyond what they normally would. Now, that wouldn't be a bad thing in and of itself. However, all of those phytoplankton eventually die. And that brings us to step three. When the phytoplankton begin to die, what happens here is that the bacteria that break down that those phytoplankton consume a lot of oxygen. Bacteria use up oxygen and respirate, so undergo cellular respiration just like any other organism. So when they break down that phytoplankton and that algae, they take up oxygen really, really quickly. And so what happens 
is that as the bacteria break down all of those uh, phytoplankton, they consume a ton of oxygen and they very quickly use up all of the oxygen in that water body. Then we move into step five, which is where the insufficient oxygen in that environment, because the bacteria have broken down that phytoplankton, that oxygen, that lack of oxygen creates what's called a dead zone. Fish and other organisms in the water consume oxygen just like we do up out of the water. So when there's no longer any oxygen in a water body, it creates what's called a dead zone or a hypoxic zone, which is a zone devoid of all oxygen. No organism which undergoes cellular uh, respiration and consumes oxygen can live inside of a dead zone. And so as a result, dead zones are completely devoid or almost completely devoid of all animal life. And dead zones really aren't pretty to look at. As you can see from the bottom here, they're completely devoid of animal life, save for anaerobic bacteria. And so they're nasty, they're usually are very murky, and you don't really see almost any animal life. And so this impacts humans because this can destroy fisheries. In the Chesapeake Bay, for example, which is something we're about to talk about, it really impacted the oyster fisheries, as well as several other fish species that people had come to rely on. So I know I'm running over 30 minutes, so I'm going to try and get through this quickly, but your book uses the Chesapeake Bay as an excellent case study. Formerly, the Chesapeake Bay was home to the most productive estuary in North America. It was thriving with hundreds of thousands of different fish, oysters, different species. It was incredibly productive. However, local farming and watershed mismanagement over time resulted in very high inputs of nitrogen and phosphorus. So we began to artificially increase the nutrients coming into the system. Opportunistic algae and cyanobacteria species, those phytoplankton that we just talked about, which rely on annual fluxes of nitrogen and phosphorus, took advantage of the excess nutrients to bloom in extraordinarily high quantities, just like the eutrophication example that we just discussed. When the algae died off continuously, decomposing bacteria would break down that algae biomass and consume large amounts of the dissolved oxygen in that water column. The lower dissolved oxygen levels uh, depleted to almost zero, and as a result, the Chesapeake Bay turned into an enormous dead zone, which you can see here over on the right-hand side of your screen. You can see right in the middle of the Chesapeake, particularly in the deeper areas of it, there was almost no oxygen found there. And so over time, the continued blooms and die-offs of these algal biomasses as a result of nitrogen and phosphorus inputs killed off all of the fish or caused them to leave the area because there was no oxygen left for them to survive. Now, that is everything that we have for Chapter 2. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I went a little over uh, the 30-minute uh, time limit that I set for myself. I hope you guys will bear with me. I really like Chapter 3, and I look forward to discussing evolution and ecology with you there. I'll see you guys then.